panel will come to order. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, hearing of the panel on 21st century uh, freight transportation. Uh, before I begin, uh, uh, I want to let everyone know we are expecting a vote series from anywhere from 145 to 230 this afternoon. With that, uh, I recognize Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, I request unanimous consent that the Chairman be permitted to declare recess during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, today's hearing uh, examines the uh, relation between logistics and a productive, efficient, and safe freight system. The movement of goods across the country may not always grab headlines, but the efficiency of freight transportation uh, has a major impact upon the lives of every American on a daily basis. From the clothes we wear to the cars we drive to the food we eat, the freight transportation system impacts all aspects of our everyday life. The logistics uh, industry is valuable to the nation's freight system because logistics improve the efficiency of the supply chain. The logistics industry uh, adds value to the supply chain by improving the planning, implementation, and control of the flow of goods from point of origin to point of consumption. As I've said before, the purpose of this panel is to provide recommendations to the Committee on ways to modernize the freight network and make the United States competitive uh, in the 21st century. We've been given cross-jurisdiction across all the different uh, uh, subcommittees, and we're going to try and do our best with that uh, opportunity. We've been working hard toward uh, our goal, holding multiple hearings and roundtable discussions and visiting critical fa uh, freight facilities in Southern California and a few days ago in the greater uh, Memphis uh, area. We also have uh, before us today an outstanding group of witnesses. Uh, I'm interested to hear from them regarding their operations as well as any recommendations they have on ways to improve our nation's freight system, and we, we would appreciate uh, specific recommendations. First, uh, we have uh, David Abney, the Chief Operating Officer of UPS. UPS is the world's largest package delivery company, delivering over 16 million pack packages to almost uh, 9 million customers every day. Uh, we, second, we have Tracy Rosser, the Senior Vice President for Transportation at Walmart. Walmart operates over 4,000 stores across all 50 states and is a large user of all modes of transportation. Third, we have uh, Ed Hamburger, uh, the President and CEO of the Association of American Railroads. AAR represents all of the Class I railroads as well as over 170 short line railroads and regional lines. Next, we have Scott Satterley, the Senior Vice President for Transportation at C.H. Robinson, testifying on behalf of the Transportation Intermediary Intermediaries Association. TIA. C.H. Robinson is a leading third-party logistics company, and TIA is the professional organization for the third-party logistics industry. Fifth, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Mark DeFabus, President and CEO of IDS. Mark is testifying on behalf of the International Warehouse Logistics Association, IWLA. IDS is a warehouse logistics company from Indianapolis, Indiana, and IWLA represents warehouse-based logistics companies. Finally, we have Richard Fisher, President of Falcon Global Edge, testifying on behalf of the Air Forwarders Association, AFA, and uh, uh, Falcon uh, is, of course, a, a, a logistics company focusing on air cargo. In his capacity as chairman of AFA, uh, he represents 360 similar companies. Thank all of our witnesses for joining us today, and I now recognize uh, our ranking member, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing today and for your leadership as this panel carries out its work. Through hearings, roundtables, and site visits, we have made steady progress in spotlighting the challenges facing our freight transportation system. Today we have the opportunity to hear how companies serving a variety of critical functions in the movement of goods employ logistics to maximize the efficient movement of freight. What these private entities are doing to move and foster commerce is remarkable. Some testimony will underscore what is very visible to consumers, such as UPS moving 16 million packages throughout the world every single day. Other testimony will reveal a largely hidden network of third-party forwarders and warehouses and warehouse-based supply chain management. Each of these companies, through innovation and adaptability, ensure that the movement of freight across the country does not come to a screeching halt. Advances in logistics have made our nation's roadways, railways, waterways, and skies real-time warehouses thanks to just-in-time delivery. 
Yet the transportation systems that facilitate freight movements have not evolved to meet the changing demands. Logistics and technology can only help companies maximize the efficiency of operating on the existing transportation network. And the bottom line is that the existing infrastructure becomes less and less adequate to maintain our nation's global competitiveness. While freight volumes across the globe are exploding, our international competitors are rapidly upgrading their transportation networks to meet the needs of the global economy. With our nation's population expected to exceed 400 million by 2050, and freight volumes expected to grow by 60 percent in the next three decades, future demands on our intermodal freight network will, re will require a bold new vision and approach to addressing these challenges. Providing the vision for a 21st century freight transportation system and ensuring that funding is available to upgrade and maintain the infrastructure on in which freight moves remains the responsibility of the Federal Government. We must work to bridge the gaps that exist in all modes, highway, rail, water and air, between current system capacity and our growing goods movement needs. Robust investments across our freight network will ensure that shippers and logistics providers will have good choices to make among modes. We must also work to specifically identify and address freight bottlenecks that cause congestion, slow the movement of goods, and come at a cost to our economy. We will hear from Mr. Abney today that if every UPS vehicle is delayed just five minutes each day, it would cost UPS $105 million annually. Particularly with respect to surface transportation, we do not currently have a reliable way to fund large-scale transportation investments whose impacts can be felt regionally and nationally. These high-cost projects overwhelm the ability of any state to take on and, as a result, most often do not advance. We need a dedicated source of funding outside of the existing state-based system to foster and prioritize these investments, which are crucial to freight movement. I am pleased to hear that the witnesses on this panel agree with this assessment. Some are willing to go further and recommend ways to fund freight movement. I look forward to an active discussion today and at future meetings of this panel, not only on investment needs, but on revenue options to meet the enormous challenges before us. I thank you, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Nadler. Does anybody else wish to say anything, uh, any other statements uh, this time? All right. We'll go ahead and proceed with the witnesses. Uh, I think I've chaired about 250 or 300 hearings since I've been here, and this, they've, they've uh, thrown me. They've reversed the uh, order for the first time. So uh, we're going to go backwards. I guess it doesn't, doesn't make any difference. <laughs> it fooled me, though. <laughs> but our first witness, we'll go, we'll go by the way they're listed uh, in the call of the hearing, and our first witness will be Mr. David Abney, the Chief Operating Officer of UPS. Mr. Abney. Your mic must not be on. How about, can you hear me now? Uh, is that working? Get closer to you. All right. Can you hear me now? All right. Chairman Duncan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the uh, panel, thank you for the opportunity to testify about how UPS utilizes logistics to move freight and the opportunities we see to improve America's productivity. UPS plays an important role in freight transportation. I have four slides, if we can show the first slide. And you can just see that we have 400,000 UPS employees, many of which are in the United States, and we have almost 100,000 commercial vehicles. At any given time, the economic value of the goods and services that are in the UPS network are equal to 6% of the U.S. GDP and 2% of the world's GDP. If you look at slide two, I'm just going to give you a quick example of logistics in action. And in this case, we have a supplier in Los Angeles, a manufacturer in New York, and a customer in uh, Germany. And I'm just going to focus on the mode, uh, tra the transportation mode changes. So it goes by truck. And then when it gets to Chicago, to our catch hub, it gets uh, shifted into rail. It will move to rail by rail to New Jersey. At that point, it will have another mode shift. It goes back to truck, and then it gets delivered uh, to the manufacturer where it's added and uh, final assembled. And then again, it goes by truck. And then, of course, it would travel by air to Germany, and then it would be delivered. And this is very common to see these uh, shifts 
in uh, modes of transportation. And you know, most times things go very well. But as the next slide will show, there are some challenges. And, uh, and when those challenges uh, occur, they can delay the, the movement of goods. And, uh, and one of those is weak intermodal connections. So when you're trying to change from one mode to the other. Now a good example of a project that's trying to correct one of these log jams is the project uh, CREATE in Chicago that Congressman Lipinski is involved in. We certainly appreciate uh, uh, your efforts there. There's always highway congestion in all the urban cities. We all know that. And then the air traffic control delays can be because of many reasons, but our antiquated navigational system is one of those. You can see at the bottom of the slide that there's real cost to this congestion and to these delays. And uh, as was quoted uh, by Ranking Member Nadler, every five minute uh, delay uh, to every one of our vehicles is $105 million. And what it causes us to do is to overstaff and to put more trucks on the road than we need to, to make up for the congestion. The last slide, just wanted to uh, talk about solutions for a minute. And, uh, and I'll highlight the first three and you can see the others. But over the decade, uh, the decades, America's transportation infrastructure has been built in silos. So highways were built to connect to highways, railroads were built to connect with railroads. Congress has tried to link them together, but it's still a patchwork. And uh, America needs a freight system that's built like a network. And I encourage Congress to take a long-term coordinated view of how the different modes can work together. For highways, the simplest improvement that we would recommend is to increase the length, but not the weight, of each trailer from 28 and a half feet to 33 feet in twin trailer configurations. This would allow freight to move more efficiently, reduce the number of trucks on the road, and would provide environmental benefits without compromising highway safety. Because we're not increasing the weight limit, there's no risk of further damage to highways and bridges. UPS also supports raising the motor fuels tax and indexing it to inflation. The other mode I'll mention is air transportation. And we endorse the increased funding of the FAA's next generation air traffic control system. And we think those uh, benefits have been well documented. So I joined UPS 39 years ago. I could not have imagined the incredible growth of global commerce, or could I have imagined the role that UPS plays in facilitating Americans, America's economy. But I also could not have imagined that nearly four decades later, America's transportation infrastructure would still be stuck in the 20th century. This panel can help modernize infrastructure, build connections between different modes, address global barriers to freight movement, can move our freight transportation system into the 21st century, boosting America's efficiency, growth, and competitiveness. It is a critical mission, and all of us stand ready at UPS to assist you in this vital effort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Abney. Our next uh, witness is uh, Mr. Tracy Rosser, who's Vice President uh, of Walmart uh, in charge of uh, transportation. Chairman Duncan, Ranking Member Nadler, distinguished members of this panel, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Tracy Rosser, and I'm Senior Vice President of Transportation for Walmart Stores. I'm responsible for domestic transportation, our private fleet operations, and global transportation. Walmart's logistics network is critical to providing goods to our customers throughout the world. The ability to replenish our stores and clubs quickly and at a low cost has been a key contributor to our success. Technology, innovation, and the commitment of our associates continue to drive our mission in providing customers an outstanding shopping experience that saves them money so that they can live better. Walmart opened its first distribution center in 1970 using a system designed to quickly and efficiently replenish our, our shelves. 
Walmart Logistics employs 77,000 associates at 150 distribution centers and 87 transportation offices. We run uh, 6,200 trucks, 55,000 trailers, and we have 7,500 drivers in our private fleet operations. And uh, I would say that our private fleet operations is among the safest with a 1.56 million miles per preventable accident. Our fleet drivers log approximately 700 million miles per year, with the average truck driver logging more than 100,000 miles a year. Our distribution center network typically serves uh, from 90 to 100 stores and uniquely caters to the needs of specific uh, stores within a 200-mile radius of those distribution centers. They move hundreds of thousands of cases each day, and our import facilities provide efficient methods of handling international merchandise. Walmart also has nine dis disaster distribution centers strategically located across the country stocked with relief supplies. We have set amb really ambitious strategic sustainability goals that include doubling our fleet efficiency by 2015 with solutions like cross-dock consolidations networks, lean routing, reduction of empty miles, and optimizing how merchandise gets loaded in our trailers. In 2012, we delivered 297 million more cases, driving 11 million fewer miles than in 2011. We continue to work with the trucking industry on a variety of innovative technologies, including hybrid and other advanced powertrains, alternative fuels, aerodynamics, and advanced tire technologies. For 2012 alone, such reductions helped us avoid emitting 103,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide, the equivalent of taking 20,000 cars off the road. In addition, by reducing food miles between farmers and markets, reducing food waste, and working with farmers to optimize production, we have been able to strengthen local economies and create logistical and environmental savings. With over 4,000 stores in the U.S. and locations in every state, Walmart is a, is a user of all modes of transportation, from our ports to our rail networks to our highway infrastructure. The transportation infrastructure is an asset to our country, offering a competitive advantage that should be utilized to the fullest. Looking ahead, we believe it is important to focus on maintaining a system that yields the highest degree of safety, efficiency, and environmental stewardship. We encourage your panel to dedicate attention and funding on areas with the highest priority maintenance needs and areas of extreme inefficiency and congestion. Like other users, we have noticed that bottlenecks can develop across all modes at points of significant freight movement as well as in and around urban areas. While we find that customers in urban areas share similar demand for goods and services in other areas of the country, the logistical costs of meeting those needs can be significant. In addition, as e-commerce grows, customers are demanding faster delivery tailored to their schedules. Without a focused effort to address timely movement of the freight through urban areas, restrictions and workarounds will continue to add cost both environmental and economic. Although we pride ourselves on our ability to adjust quickly, challenges underscore the need for a national freight policy. State and local regulations often share similar goals of safety and efficiency, but the variety of measures can be cumbersome and costly to interstate commerce. We encourage the development of solutions that address the needs of our transportation network in as uniform a manner as possible. Maintaining a strong infrastructure will also help our suppliers to remain competitive. Walmart recently announced a commitment to buy an additional $50 billion in U.S. products over the next 10 years. As the economy continues to improve, domestic producers will rely on a lean, trans efficient transportation network to get their products to market quickly and cost effectively. To conclude, as a significant user of the Nation's infrastructure, we understand the value of our Nation's system and of ensuring that it remains competitive in the decades to come. We encourage the use and development of safe, efficient, and sustainable solutions in freight movement. And we also believe that attention and financial resources should be directed towards areas and high needs of maintenance, congestion points, and challenges of urbanization. Finally, a clear national freight policy can promote interstate commerce while meeting safety and efficiency needs and goals. Walmart appreciates that this panel has been tasked to consider ways to best meet the demands of the Nation's freight network. There is no easy answer here, and we look forward to working with you uh, as you address the challenges ahead. Thank you again for your time today. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosser. Next is Mr. Edward R. Hemberger, who is the uh, President and CEO of the Association of American Railroads. Mr. Mr. Hemberger. Chairman, thanks to you and the other members of the committee for the opportunity to be here to represent North America's freight railroads and address this important topic. Uh, a couple of years ago, Mr. Chairman, we came to the conclusion that the story of logistics and freight 
needed to be told on a wider basis. And so we went ahead and put together a video. It's uh, a bit longer. I do have a clip I'd like to show you today under the theory that a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is about a minute and a half of uh, what we believe the logistics chain does. May not be as catchy as some other logistics uh, things I've seen, but uh, uh, we're, we, we think it gets the point across. And I hope the point that you take away from that is that we see ourselves as an interrelated network. Obviously, it was freight rail centric, but you saw a lot of our other uh, modal partners in that. And working together with our uh, uh, partners and customers here, we create jobs, grow the economy, and keep American products competitive on world markets. Uh, let me just get right to the end. How do we keep that going? In terms of public policy, we recommend, uh, as my two uh, previous colleagues did, that uh, you continue to focus uh, programs to improve the first mile and last mile connections where freight is handed off from one mode to another, from truck to rail or rail to truck at intermodal terminals. Connecting, uh, improving these connections will lead to large increases uh, in efficiency and fluidity throughout the network. Uh, while we have been reinvesting uh, at more private capital than ever before, $25 billion this year alone, 40 cents of every revenue dollar back into the infrastructure, as you saw, $500 billion in the last 30 years, sound public policy can help to ensure uh, that these investments continue. Uh, so we would say, number one, please keep in place the current balanced economic regulatory structure governing our industry. Number two, please encourage more voluntary, and I emphasize voluntary, public-private partnerships for freight rail infrastructure uh, improvement projects. Three, uh, please try to improve the environmental and other reviews uh, to make them more efficient by shortening the time it takes uh, for these reviews of all freight uh, expansion projects, of course, in ways that do not adversely affect the quality of those reviews. Uh, fourth, we ask that you defer consideration of any truck size and weight legislation until the congressionally mandated study in MAP 21 is uh, completed next year. Uh, and five, uh, sort of a, a more of a, a philosophy, uh, ensure that various freight modes pay their own way. That is to say, the user pay concept has worked very well uh, for developing and growing uh, the infrastructure in the country. We believe that that user pay concept should continue into the future. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify and look forward to answering any questions. Well, thank you very much. Our next witness is Mr. Scott Satterley, who is with C.H. Robinson Worldwide on behalf of the Transportation Intermediaries Association. Chairman Duncan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. As one of the nation's largest third-party logistics providers and proud member of the Transportation Intermediaries Association, C.H. Robinson has a unique view on how goods and commerce flow from manufacturer to consumer. My name is Scott Satterley. I'm Senior Vice President for C.H. Robinson. I joined C.H. Robinson in 1991, and I'm responsible for overseeing the operations of our 175 U.S. branch offices, which employ more than 8,400 U.S. employees. C.H. Robinson was founded in 1905 and facilitates the movement of over 11.5 million shipments a year. 
We have been named the number one 3PL for two years in a row by Inbound Logistics Magazine. Additionally, C.H. Robinson is a member of the Transportation Intermediaries Association. The TIA is a professional organization of the 162 billion third-party logistics industry. TIA represents over 1,300 member companies, most of whom are small family-owned businesses. C.H. Robinson relies on all the nation's freight capacity to manage our customer shipments on a daily basis. We do not own equipment with wheels, so we are mode neutral when tendering shipments. We monitor and qualify over 45,000 U.S.-based motor carriers for proper authority, valid insurance, and other data points. 82 percent of the carriers operate three or fewer trucks, and 98 percent of the carriers operate 25 or fewer trucks. Many of these companies do not have their own dedicated sales force, so companies like C.H. Robinson enhance their sales capabilities. We also have access to all Class I railroads for intermodal freight. We operate a series of gateways and consolidation centers for air freight and ocean freight and perform customs clearances as a licensed customs broker. Some shippers only use our services a handful of times when they need assistance finding a truck, while other customers have fully integrated our services and even our people into their transportation departments. So how does freight get assigned and picked up across the country in a regional or long-haul marketplace? We act as a traditional freight broker, broker for almost all of our transportation customers. If our rates and service levels are competitive, we bring thousands of carriers of all sizes to our customers that normally would never have a chance to access their freight due to technology, payment, or contracting requirements. For some customers, we also act as a 4PL or shipper's agent by executing their routing guide. In theory, transportation should be pretty simple. If you have a load you need transported, you locate a truck, you assign the truck, and wait for the freight to deliver. Unfortunately, many variables are making the matching of a load with an available truck much more complex than that. For example, weather and traffic delays, equipment failures, changing regulation, lane capacity imbalances, business seasonality, and economic conditions all add tremendous complexity to the system. In addition, systematic problems such as short lead times and heavy reliance on expedited services, excessive loading and unloading time, poor visibility Poor visibility to inbound or outbound freight and securing surge capacity during busy seasons combine to add inefficiency to the country's transportation system. Property freight brokers and 3PLs like C.H. Robinson mitigate these factors that contribute to inefficiency by matching the right load to the right piece of equipment at the right time. Finally, we offer these recommendations where government can reduce both chronic and unexpected exceptions, therefore increasing efficiency in the supply chain. One, provide shippers and brokers clarity in which carriers are safe to hire in regards to the CSA program. Freight brokers and shippers should not need to second guess the FMCSA on who is authorized to operate on a nation's roadways. Two, encourage our uh, transportation system to have built-in modal flexibility. An example of modal flexibility would be an increase in rail ramps across the nation or a viable short sea shipping program. Three, make sure trucking remains a great opportunity for the small and medium-sized entrepreneurs. They provide the flexibility and service to keep our entire transp transportation system in equilibrium. Barriers for small carriers include California environmental regulation, which is significantly different from the rest of the country. Four, help industry address the growing rise of sophisticated cargo theft. Regional cargo theft task forces are under increasing budgetary pressures from law enforcement agencies, but provide industry and consu consumers valuable deterrent to a costly problem. And lastly, ensure consistency between food safety regulations and cargo claims regulations. It is now common for a shipper to request the destruction of hundreds of boxes of food without clearly establishing proof of actual damage. 3PLs are often caught in the middle of a tension between freight cargo claims responsibility and food safety fears. We are encouraged and optimistic that the next highway bill can and will find ways to improve the nation's freight efficiency by addressing some of the non-infrastructure barriers to the efficient flow of freight across the country as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next witness is Mr. Mark DeFabus, President and CEO of the Integrated Distribution Services. Mr. DeFabus. Chairman. Chairman Duncan, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. I represent members of the International Warehouse Logistics Association and serve on the organization's executive committee. The IWLA is the only trade association for warehouse-based third-party logistics providers. These are companies like mine that offer warehouse-based supply chain management services to other businesses across North America. Independent warehouses are a vital part of the economy. We best serve our customers by identifying efficiencies that allow goods and materials to move with more velocity from creation to the end consumer, while navigating the legislative and regulatory waters that affect goods movement. 
we do all of this while constantly looking for ways to achieve efficiencies within the overall supply chain. And our success is evidenced by the fact that logistics costs as a percentage of GDP have fallen almost in half, from 16.2 percent of GDP in 1981 to 8.5 percent in 2012. Our unique position in the supply chain allows us to understand just how goods move across the country and exactly where the system needs to focus to ensure smooth commerce in the future. Today's commercial freight is multimodal, and the warehouse based 3PL is the point at which modal interchange happens. This is one reason IWLA members' facilities are located near every major airport, seaport, harbor, rail yard, interstate interchange and why adequate access to these locations is imperative. As I mentioned, velocity and security and accuracy within the supply chain are mission critical outputs. This is the reason that warehouse based 3PLs provide a growing number of value added services. These warehouses, once only big boxes where goods were stored, now may label, package, sort, blend, test and save customers on transportation costs to speed the process. These same warehouses may also support made-to-order operations and handle returns processing and refurbishing of returns. Warehouse-based 3PLs also play a key role in another growing segment of the economy, Internet commerce. This increasing amount of e-commerce sales means more shipments are being delivered directly to the consumer. This fact demonstrates that commercial freight does not just move on interstate highways, but extends all the way to the residential doorstep. This new model, based on value-added services, <clears throat> exposes warehouse-based 3PLs to regulations that previously only applied to manufacturers. One distinction between the warehouse and manufacturer is important to keep in mind. Warehouse-based 3PLs do not own any of the products that move through our facilities. Ownership of the goods remains with the customer, and the relationship is that of a bailor and bailee governed by Article 7 of the Uniform Commercial Code. It seems that this relationship is often not understood or considered during the drafting of Federal rules and regulations. While warehouse operators are prepared to live by rules and regulations governing the handling and storage of various products, we can only act upon the direction and information supplied by our customer, the bailor. As Bailey, we should not be held to the same level of liability that applies to the owner of the goods. From its unique position in the supply chain, the warehouse-based 3PL can see and is directly affected by bottlenecks and choke points within the commercial freight network. These are often manifest themselves at the warehouse where increased costs are incurred to keep the supply chain moving in a coordinated fashion. A strong logistics industry enables a healthy and growing economy, but a strong logistics industry is only possible with freight policies that support the needs of the 21st century supply chain. With this in mind, the members of the International Warehouse Logistics Association asked the committee to consider the following. Develop new approaches to infrastructure financing for all commercial transit modes. These can come via traditional revenue sources and through new sources, such as user fees, mileage-based taxes, and greater use of private investment. Implement policies to ensure that revenue designated for commercial freight projects cannot be diverted in the same way that highway trust funds are today. Guarantee that fees that are collected on imports at the ports through the U.S. Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund are used for their intended purpose, dredging and maintaining the nation's ports and waterways. Also, with expansion of the Panama Canal, many ports will need dredging to accommodate the larger ships transferring through the canal. We have made other recommendations as a part of our written testimony, and we would ask your attention to those as well. But on behalf of the International Warehouse Logistics Association, I thank you for your time and our industry stands ready to work in partnership with the committee on ways to enhance commercial freight movement that will result in economic growth for the economy. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Mr. Richard Fisher, who is president of Falcon Global Edge for the Air Forwarders Association. Chairman Duncan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify before the committee today. I also would like to thank Chairman Schuster and Ranking Member Rahal for setting up this important panel. My name is Richard Fisher, and I'm president of a forwarding company called Falcon Global Edge, and I'm also chairman of the Air Forwarders Association. Falcon Global Edge is headquartered in Boston and operates both domestically and internationally. 
Today, I'm testifying on behalf of the Air Forwarders Association. Our association represents 360 member companies employing tens of thousands of employees and contractors. AFA members range from small businesses to large companies employing thousands, with business models varying from domestic to worldwide operations, with some members operating their own aircraft. In short, we are the travel agents for freight. We move cargo throughout the supply chain in a time and cost efficient manner, regardless of the transport mode that is chosen. The global economic downturn continues to erode forwarder margins in the face of increasing costs, and these expenses only escalate as the regulatory web expands. For example, in the case of an air shipment between Washington and Paris, the timely delivery of our customer's product is dependent on a myriad of U.S. government agencies and regulations, beginning with TSA and CBP. It is critical that both FAA and CBP are adequately staffed to manage flights and clear shipments quickly and efficiently. When going to or from the airport, shipments fall that move by truck fall under the purview of the DOT and the trucker himself falls under the oversight of FMCSA. Ultimately, one import shipment arriving in the United States could meet 13 regulatory agencies at our border, and delays can and will result. Sun Tzu once said, the line between disorder and order lies in logistics, true in war and in forwarding. Aviation is a key for many of our members' businesses. According to the International Air Transport Association, air cargo transports over $6.4 trillion worth of goods on an annual basis, amounting to 35% of trade by value. Allow me at this point to thank the committee for resolving the FAA furlough situation and keeping our control towers open and operating. As an industry, we are heavily dependent on passenger carriers. As an aside, the administration's proposal to impose billions of dollars in new and higher aviation taxes should be flatly rejected. It is in our nation's economic interest to have a healthy and robust aviation sector, and increasing taxes on airlines runs contrary to this goal. Our industry's operations are immensely complicated by new regulatory burdens. Conversely, the government can assist by continuing to support the modernization of our antiquated air traffic control system by deploying what is called NextGen, which has been alluded to by my colleagues. The benefits of NextGen have demonstrated that the technology can save flight time, greatly increase the safety of flight operations, and reduce emissions. I urge this committee to maintain its strong support for next-gen development. AFA members and their customers see the impact of high fuel prices every day by paying higher freight rates and higher prices at the pump. Still, we also realize that our shipments require good roads and bridges to get to and from the airport, and current funding sources are insufficient to maintain this vital infrastructure. For example, one in nine bridges in the United States remain structurally deficient. Proposed solutions range from increasing the federal gas tax to a vehicle miles travel tax. Before embracing a higher tax, we need assurance that existing taxes are being invested as intended. Given the new hours of service regulation that will take effect next Monday, and require as many as 40,000 new truckers, it is even more critical for the CSA program to better work for industry. We need to have surety on who is authorized to operate on our nation's highways. In conclusion, I urge members of the committee to remain vigilant on the promulgation of additional regulations and its impact on the freight industry. Thank you for this opportunity and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you very much. I apologize, but uh, we do have two votes going on on the floor right now, and so we will have to be in recess until we conclude those votes. Thank you. But, uh, we, uh, but we certainly appreciate uh, 
all the testimony that all of the uh, witnesses gave, and uh, now we'll get into a little uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Abney, the, uh, uh, as you understand, I think the purpose of this panel is to uh, try to coordinate all our different subcommittees and come across uh, with a way we've got to always trying to be to, trying to improve uh, uh, our uh, freight mobility or freight transportation system. And uh, uh, you uh, said in your testimony that our present system was built in uh, silos and is more a patchwork of uh, modes. If, if you could, uh, if you could change one thing about uh, uh, how the federal government addresses uh, our freight system, what what would it be? What do, what is what is the the big thing that you see for for uh, UPS? You know, the big thing for us would be long term planning that would link the intermodal connections. So, those strategic locations in the U.S., whether they be for national importance or whether they be regional, that if those intermodal connections would be strengthened, where we do switch from ocean to ground or from ground to rail. And uh, Project Create is a good example of an area that, uh, that is focused on that. But, but right now we just see that highways are meant to connect with highways and the, the railroads to railroads and, uh, and that would be the area we'd like to see the biggest focus on. Mr. Rosser, you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for the question. Um, I think you're already doing it, uh, frankly. The, um, when, when you think about the, uh, the issues that you're addressing, I think you're, you're nailing it. So studying the problems, continuing research and engagement with the private sector like you're doing uh, to, to understand where the issues are, um, continue to invest in the intermodal network. Uh, in terms of identifying and finding those areas that add costs. So our business, we're all about uh, helping our customers save money so that they can live better. And uh, those, those issues that Mr. Abney talked about are critical issues that add cost to our, to our customers. And uh, I think solving those issues on behalf of those constituents is, is a really uh, important thing. And, uh, and so I would just add focusing on those things that improve the safety and efficiency of the network in total. Let me ask you something else I'm a little curious about. Uh, when, uh, uh, oh, I think just about a year after 9-11, uh, the FedEx people told me that they had spent about $200 million on security measures that they wouldn't have spent if it hadn't been for 9-11. And it just, it just really boggles my mind how much we have spent on the federal level, the state level, all the local governments, and then all that the private companies have spent uh, on security. And I'm wondering, has, uh, and now we have this huge industry related to security, is that spending, has it, uh, has it leveled off or, or I, what, I guess what I'm thinking about is, is a few months after 9-11, the Wall Street Journal had an editorial. And they said, uh, they noticed that all the departments and agencies were uh, sending up a request for additional money for security. And uh, um, they, um, they said from now on, a wise legislative policy would be that any time the word security was mentioned, a wise legislative policy would be to give it twice the weight and four times the scrutiny. Yet we're not doing that. The Congress votes for anything that has the word security attached to it. And then I go to these ports and I go all these places and I see all the trucks have to stop and go through the machines and all that kind of stuff. And it just seems to me we've gone ridiculously overboard on all that stuff. But uh, are your companies or your associations, what do, what, do you, what do you find in that regard? Are you still having to spend a lot of money on the Security? Anybody? Yes, sir, Mr. Abney? Yes, I could answer for UPS, and, and the answer is that it continues to grow. And, uh, and I wouldn't tie it to just 9-11. I would tie it to all the terrorism activity that's happened uh, throughout. And one of the uh, areas that we are really working on and working with the federal government on is to take a risk-based approach. 
So while we deliver almost 16 and a half million packages a day, most of those packages we would have no reason to suspect. So with the technology that we have that can put various parameters in and tying it into the uh, federal government system, we can zero in on those areas that are, are, have the most risk of security. And that would be a better use of the dollars and it would allow you to target versus this shotgun approach. Well, I just think, I just think it's sad that we're spending so much money on that and all of that. But uh, Mr. Hamburger, in your uh, testimony, you mentioned uh, uh, that first mile and last mile connections uh, are vulnerable to disruptions. Uh, uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? What are, what are, your, uh, what are you talking about? What are your solutions there? Well, I think one of the uh, uh, areas that you've probably seen is when you were out in Southern California, the transfer from the ports to a, a rail yard, for example. Uh, and I know that one of our members has been working for eight years, and if uh, you would ask me where I think we need to focus attention, it's on improving the regulatory system. Uh, been working for eight years to get sited an intermodal transfer station uh, that's going to take millions of trucks a year off the road. Uh, and they finally got their approval this year, and now, of course, they'll be in court for the next couple of years. Uh, and, but it's, it's that transfer from uh, one mode to another. Uh, and uh, uh, oftentimes, if there's an intermodal yard sited somewhere, uh, how do you get it from the uh, rail uh, yard to the, uh, to the interstate? Uh, so that kind of coordination uh, in getting it from one mode to another. All right. I'm going to, I've got many more questions, but I'm going to go now to Mr. Lipinski first. And uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this uh, hearing on logistics. Um, pr appreciate the uh, participation of all the witnesses today. And a couple things that um, okay. I just wanted to mention, I probably won't have time to come back uh, for comments on this, but I just want to make sure I mention the, uh, I think next gen was mentioned. I think that's very important that uh, we move forward more quickly on that than uh, we have. And also what Mr. Nadler had mentioned in his opening comments uh, about the importance of having a Projects of National Regional Significance uh, fund so that we can uh, uh, make sure that we get the funding that's needed for some of these really, really big projects that are critical to, uh, to our nation. Uh, Mr. Abney, I appreciate your uh, uh, package flow example and your comments about uh, about create and how important create is when we were out in um, the ports of Long Beach in LA they talked about the importance 2,000 miles away of how important create was to them uh, your uh, testimony highlights that Illinois is the transportation hub of the country uh, and you know I have the honor of representing Hodgkin's which is home of the uh, UPS Chicago area consolidation hub uh, that you uh, reference in your example. Uh, facility employs over 6,000 people and sorts 1.3 to 1.5 million packages every day. It's also located adjacent to the BNSF Chicago Willow Springs Intermodal Facility, which opened at the same time as the hub in, uh, in 95. I've visited that complex uh, a number of times. I'm always impressed not just by the logistics used there, but also the uh, men and women who, who worked there. Uh, so the, the example that you had, uh, had, had shown us, Mr. Abney, um, I had noticed, and actually Mr. Nadler had mentioned this to me as, as he was leaving, uh, the, what impacts the decision about what modes to use, because I noticed it was packages moved by truck from uh, California to Chicago and then by rail from Chicago to, uh, to New York. What, what influences that, those decisions? Uh, uh, excellent question. We've noticed that over the years, too, believe me. And, uh, you know, we put over 3,000 loads or containers a day on the rails. We are one of the largest uh, customers, and we've been doing that my entire career at UPS. What causes us to put this particular segment on the road is time in transit. If we truck it to Chicago, we can uh, cut at least a day's time in transit the way it works with the train schedules. And so we look at each of these lanes 
and where we can uh, place it on the rail and maintain the time in transit, we certainly do so. That's our first option. Where we can improve time in transit, we have to measure the increased cost compared to the customer demand. And in this case, to be able to reduce a day's uh, time in transit, we put it on the uh, road. But I do know you do move by rail also from uh, out from uh, Southern California to the uh, Willow Springs cash. I understand. Okay, I, I wanted to um, ask Mr. Rosser. Uh, you had talked about increasing your efficiency of, of your trucks on, on the road. How did you as a company increase the, this efficiency of movement? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman Lipinski. So uh, we, we had an objective set forth back in 2005 where our CEO challenged us to double our, our fleet efficiency, our own trucks that we operate. Uh, by 2015, I'm, I'm glad to say that we're about 80 percent there. Um, and, and still have some work to do. Uh, our focus has been on moving the most cases uh, over the fewest amount of miles and, and in the most efficient equipment. So kind of a three-pronged approach. And uh, in the way we measure our efficiency is cases shipped per gallon of fuel burned is how we, how we measure that. Um, I would tell you that in, uh, in, in 2011, uh, we delivered 297 million more cases and avoided 11 million miles. And I, I stated earlier, too, uh, compared to 2007, we've moved 658 million more cases, driving 298 million less miles, which saved us uh, about $875 million that we were able to pass along uh, that savings to our customers. Um, if, you, if you think about uh, the approach, I would tell you that we're, we're probably a little biased, and we think we have the best truck drivers in the industry that, uh, that are working for Walmart stores. And uh, it starts with our people, uh, and uh, our truck drivers are very cognizant of, uh, of the, our fuel economy and our tractors. Um, we, we work on some of the basics uh, relative to fuel economy with engine calibrations, driver training, managing our speed, uh, our maintenance programs, things of that nature. Uh, we're constantly looking with, uh, at advanced technology with our uh, vendor partners, uh, looking at uh, aerodynamics, weight, uh, things of that nature, uh, fuel efficient tires, et cetera. And then uh, the other things that we're looking at that are, that are fairly basic uh, is just increasing what we are able to put on the trailer. Uh, we work with our merchants and our suppliers to reduce packaging size, uh, so we're able to move uh, more product. Uh, in our trailers with uh, more efficient packaging. Uh, we use technology with loading techniques and managing our loading techniques to get uh, more cases per trailer. Uh, for us, one additional case per trailer can save us in our network about uh, $680,000 uh, over the course of a year, just uh, getting that one extra case per trailer. Uh, we look at uh, delivery frequency uh, to our stores, uh, multi-stop uh, networks, uh, we optimize the uh, utilized technology to uh, reduce our network miles driven. Uh, our supplier base is constantly changing. Our ship points are constantly changing. And so we have to constantly evaluate what the network looks like, and we do so on an ongoing basis to reduce miles driven. And so I would tell you that it's, uh, you know, it's not any one thing. It's a recipe of a variety of uh, basic fundamental operations that uh, have allowed us to, to reach the 80 percent uh, point of our goal. Thank you. Thank and, you. Thank you. I had another question, uh, but uh, let me just throw out, if we don't get another round, I just wanted to, I was going to do this for a question for the record, Mr. Fisher and Mr. Abney, about the uh, impact of uh, night tower closures at uh, airports, because I know Midway in my district was threatened with that. Ontario uh, was also threatened. Uh, with that and uh, just interested in the impact if, if that happened in, in the future, which is still uh, threatened, but way over time now, so I'll yield back. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Webster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Hamburger. Uh, are there any Federal laws that are um, impeding efficient freight transportation? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
I, I think there are, uh, uh, as I mentioned, permitting regulations, whether or not there are laws or regulations that are uh, slowing down the sighting of. Okay, well, I'll add yeah. that to my question, too. All right, uh, laws or regulations. Sl slowing down the sighting of uh, uh, intermodal yards. Uh, I, I mentioned the one uh, uh, in Southern California. What I have learned this morning is that the uh, terminus, uh, the, the other end of that uh, yard where the railroad wanted to uh, move the trailers and the containers across the country to Edgerton, Kansas, uh, there was a dry riverbed there that uh, led to a lawsuit uh, going to the State Supreme Court of Kansas uh, uh, challenging the uh, uh, Corps granting a 404 permit uh, to go ahead and build an intermodal yard uh, uh, around that dry water uh, dry riverbed. Uh, so those kinds of regulations, I, th I think, are uh, something that I know the committee has worked on uh, in MAP 21. I know you've tried to do it uh, in WERDA. Uh, if that moves, that we would ask that you take a look at some way of streamlining regulations uh, in, in the rail infrastructure building uh, air arena as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Um, Abney. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the emergence of e-commerce affecting the, the logistics change, uh, chain? You know, it's had a, a big effect on our business. It, uh, at one time, uh, the largest part of our business, and it's about a uh, little more than 50 percent now, was uh, uh, from shipper to another business, so B2B. And uh, so we were delivering 50 to 100 packages to a uh, commercial stop. Now we see a lot more B to C, which is going to be one, one and a half packages per stop. And, uh, and it's just a, a fact of life. And it's one thing that, uh, that through our technology has allowed us to make changes to where we can address those needs. So now we have an example of that is, is UPS My Choice, where a end consumer that's uh, got a package coming to their house, can request to have that package redirected, redirected to their office, redirected to their neighbor, or held for a day until they're going to be home. So it's those kind of creative things that we do that allow us to uh, adjust to, to this change. But, uh, and we see it especially during Christmas time. You know, the percent of packages that we deliver to residential neighborhoods increases greatly, and we've had to adjust our network to the. Thank you. Anyone else on that question? Uh, Congressman Webster, I'd, I'd also say that uh, what we, you know, as e-commerce grows, um, there's a number of, of services that are offered through UPS, FedEx, other parcel carriers that also are these hybrid services that utilize the U.S. Postal Service for last mile delivery for some of this these lighter weight packages. And I would say that, you know, as, as we look at logistics in total, there probably is some role that, that the, the Postal Service is playing today to, to facilitate e-commerce for delivery of those lightweight packages that needs to be considered as well. And as I said in my comments, I, the, the, you know, the commercial freight now with e-commerce is moving all the way to the doorstep. So we can't just say that it's moving on the uh, freeways. It's, uh, it's really moving into the you know, residential streets, and how are we going to efficiently do that? Thank you. Uh, yes, one more. Uh, the Air Forwarders Association, Mr. Webster, has a, um, a slightly different view. As it applies to our business, we just recently endorsed IATA's uh, e-airway bill initiative, which is to transmit all information to air carriers in a standardized fashion electronically. We are a, a paper-dependent business and have been for years. So we will see in the future all of that information going electronically to carriers, which will make us more efficient and make the carriage of freight more efficient as we go forward. From a personal perspective in my own company, we've been electronic now for several years. We don't like paper. We've tried to get rid of it. All of our communications to our other offices are done electronically. There's very little document transfer. So it's the wave of the future for logistics to embrace e-commerce in that fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to go to Ms. Hahn, but I do have to tell you that uh, 
uh, people used to say that we, we had to go to all the computers to uh, uh, cut down on the paperwork, and all it's done is greatly increase the papers that come into, the, into our offices. Ms. Hong. Thank you. Uh, and I really appreciate everyone uh, coming here today and listening to your testimony. And I, too, always want to give a shout out to uh, Chairman Schuster and Ranking Member Rahal for uh, agreeing to impanel us uh, to, as I understand, the first time come up with recommendations for a national freight policy as we move forward. So uh, I, I know everyone on this panel is listening very intently to your suggestions and your recommendations as we really try to come up with a national policy. Uh, understanding fundamentally how important goods movement is to our economy, uh, to being uh, competitive globally, uh, to uh, creating good jobs. Uh, so this is really, I think, a great moment uh, in our history as we move forward to create one that, that makes a lot of sense. And um, uh, one of the things I was going to ask, and, and any, of, any of you could respond, should we look at doing something really bold like uh, really start to, to talk about opening our ports uh, for off-peak cargo movement. I, I know in uh, 2002, when I traveled to Hong Kong and Singapore and saw those ports operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I came back to Los Angeles and spearheaded what has been sort of an incremental uh, program. It's called Pier Pass, and it's uh, been pretty successful uh, in moving cargo off-peak. It's now four nights a week, and you know, maybe one day on the weekend, maybe not. Wondering how that would impact logistics for all of you uh, if you weren't always trying to meet uh, gates that were only open certain hours. And is that something we should look at as a policy for all of our ports uh, in the country? I'd like to hear your responses on that. I will uh, I'll take first stab at that. Uh, thank, thank you for the question, Congresswoman Hahn. Um, so our, our customers shop our stores 24 hours a day. Um, and what we try to do in every decision we make is we start with what, what does the customer want, what do they expect, and then we work to, to solve their, 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 uh, their need. And uh, our, as a consequence of our customers wanting to shop 24 hours a day, most of our stores are open 24 hours a day. And and, you know, I, I will say Walmart was one of my partners uh, when we were crafting the off-peak cargo movement policy at Long, Los Angeles Long Beach. Yes, and thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, our distribution centers operate 24 hours a day, and our, our trucks are running 24 hours a day, trains are running 24 hours a day. Uh, and I would just uh, I would tell you that to the extent that we can fully utilize the assets that the country has, um, you know, we we are open to those discussions uh, to have, you know, the discussions where we can operate safely and efficient efficiently and fully utilize the the great assets that we do have as a as a country. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, thank you, Congressman Hahn. I can tell you personally that when uh, I want to congratulate you on the Peer Pass program and what you've implemented, but I have to tell you I was terrified by it when I first saw it. But we've adapted, and I think that knowing that ocean transportation is an imperfect science, if many more ports had Peer Pass programs and more open gate programs, we would be much more successful in getting product to our customers. I think it's a good idea. Well, you know, it was one of the things I, I thought about when I worked on that was, again, I mean, obviously I would like to fix every highway, every bridge, widen freeways, more near dock, on dock. I'd like to do it all. But to, uh, in the meantime, uh, it seems like we could utilize our current infrastructure uh, more efficiently, smarter. Uh, and, and it would give a lot of the goods movement industry an opportunity to travel our roads when the commuters uh, are also not on the roads. I know that the truck drivers would love uh, to not have us on the road with them because uh, they don't think we know how to drive either. 
So I, I think it would, uh, you know, really sort of uh, move cargo, I think, in a more, more efficient way. The other thing, my time's almost up, you know, I'm a big believer in spending the money that we're collecting for the purpose for which it was collected. And the harbor maintenance uh, tax has been collected year after year after year. We have an $8 billion surplus. Uh, we're not spending that money uh, for the purpose it was intended, which was to, first of all, dredge our harbors and ports and waterways so that we have uh, you know, efficient movement of cargo. Uh, so I'm advocating, got a, I have a, a bill that would, would, uh, would encourage us to spend that money and also possibly look at, uh, you, you talked about the, last, the first mile and the last mile. I, I also think it would be something we might look at if, if ports have already completed their dredging. Uh, is, is this money that we could use for landside uh, in, infrastructure and improvement? I mean, we worry about cargo being diverted to uh, ports in uh, Canada and Mexico. I've always been told that the number one reason cargo is diverted, it's not for some new regulation or environmental uh, fee that we place on containers, but it's because of landside congestion. You all want that stuff in and out and to the destination as quickly as possible. So I'd like to hear you uh, give an affirmative uh, to Congress actually as part of this policy, uh, spending the tax for the purpose it was intended uh, in the locations that it matters. Please, please, please nod your heads affirmatively out loud for the record. <laughs> you think that's a good idea that we should? Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we do need to uh, do more with that harbor maintenance uh, yeah, we got fund. It. Uh, Mr. Amberger, you mentioned in your testimony that uh, you're ready to, or the railroads are ready to handle the, the traffic from the uh, expansion of the Panama Canal. And, and uh, you know, this is my 25th year on this uh, uh, committee, and I, uh, I can remember uh, many years ago when they thought a 4,000 TEU ship was a pretty yeah. big yes. ship. And then they started talking about, uh, they thought an 8,000 TEU yep. ship was huge. And now, of course, they're talking about, it's, it's just mind boggling, uh, uh, the ships they're talking about. So we're, uh, every, everything is in this together. I mean, when we were out in California, for instance, Matt Rose told us that uh, uh, his uh, his uh, big, biggest uh, customer now was the was the Hunt uh, Trucking Company. That and uh, uh, he said a few years ago they were 90 percent trucking, 10 percent uh, by rail. He said today they're 80 percent by rail. And that and and uh, there's other examples like that that I can give. But uh, uh, are are you are there any particular choke points? Are there any places, for instance, uh, all the ports are wanting to expand and, and so forth. Uh, are, are the railroads uh, uh, set up to handle uh, big increases uh, from uh, uh, most of these ports? Or are, there, are there particular places where we've got to, where we need to do more? Uh, well, of course, it's my job to answer yes. Uh, we are ready. Uh, but in, in fact, it is uh, impossible to predict exactly how the opening of the canal, and we were talking about it during the break, uh, uh, you know, there are so many factors that come into play, uh, depending on what's being shipped. Is timeliness of transit the most important thing? Is it the cost? Is it what is the fee at the uh, uh, canal going to be? Uh, what will the, uh, the, uh, the land side facilities be? Uh, will the ports be dredged? Which ports will be dredged? So it's impossible to predict exactly uh, what the impact will be on the flow of, of commerce. But what I'm trying to get across in my testimony is that our members are, in fact, investing with ports. I know in uh, Florida, uh, major uh, investment going on with the state and with Florida East Coast, CSX, uh, trying to make sure that that port uh, in southern uh, Florida is ready. Uh, the East Coast uh, uh, carriers uh, spending uh, money uh, to uh, be able to double stack uh, their tunnels. Uh, tunnels maybe 100 years old uh, weren't designed uh, for uh, double track or double stack, and so a lot of money going into that. 
the intermodal yards that are being built in the center of the country, uh, uh, you know, Matt's uh, uh, investment out there and uh, Union Pacific's investments uh, on, on the West Coast. So we hope we are ready. Uh, we think we will be. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is not something that is sneaking up on anybody here. Uh, I think everybody is uh, trying, to, uh, trying to be best positioned to, uh, to, to handle the flow of commerce wherever it does well, I guess, uh, hit. Uh, you know, I guess what, uh, and, and, and you have covered some of it, but uh, what, what I guess uh, partly of what I was aiming at was uh, like in, in Southern California we saw that uh, at the ports uh, most things have to be trucked out to where the railroads are. And I'm just wondering, are there places, uh, the Panama Canal or other places in the country where we, where we really need to expand the rail capacity or the lines coming in, anything like that? Are there any particular places where you see that we may have a problem in the years ahead? Well, let me, let me get back for the record on that, okay. but just draw your attention to the fact that, again, each, each one of these Class ones has corridors in mind, and I would be remiss if I didn't. Uh, join Mr. Abney and uh, thank you, Mr. Lipinski, for his leadership on the CREATE project. Uh, one third of all uh, rail cars uh, originate, terminate, or transit through Chicago. So that uh, is, is an area we've been focused on, and we need to get that to a conclusion. Uh, but I, I, let, me, let me get back with more specifics okay. for you. All right, Mr. Satterley, you uh, mentioned the need to uh, reduce chronic delays due to congestion. You, you got into that uh, pretty much in your testimony. Uh, are, there, are there any ways in which uh, you feel we can better allocate or better use our transportation funding to uh, go at this congestion problem a little bit better? I mean, we all know it is there. And then, too, you mentioned that the typical lead time uh, for shipments is only 48 hours. Uh, uh, are there any um, ways that you know of that, you know, that we could work on that to, uh, or do anything to help on that? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, your question, one, your question is a very good one. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's challenging to answer when you think about all the different sorts of investments that you could make. You know, we think a little bit about congestion. You know, we think about the supply chain as a whole. It's really about trying to drive as much efficiency and streamlining and simplifying things, you know, as necessary. And so, you know. From an infrastructural standpoint, you know, ways to be able to uh, create opportunities for a more efficient uh, transportation over the road with the asset-based players, uh, you know, to be able to get from point A to point B more efficiently within the, uh, the regulatory laws, uh, investments in the road systems, all those sorts of things are, I think, have been discussed and are, you know, are, are very important. When we think about it from a 3PL standpoint, you know, it's really about creating as much flexibility as you possibly can. Uh, to be able to, to make it as efficient uh, and drive out inefficient inefficiencies uh, by, uh, uh, you know, really decongesting, you know, the flow of information and the flow of the, you know, the transport of the goods themselves. And so the, you know, the specific things that would help from an infrastructural standpoint, I, I made a couple comments, you know, increasing rail ramps and, you know, the regulatory uh, laws that may affect uh, or help improve things like short, sh you know, short sea shipping programs, you know, kind of like uh, Congresswoman Hahn was, you know, referencing, you know, those things help speed up the infrastructure and the flow of goods. And so, you know, what we see is there are some things that, that affect both infrastructurally and regulatory uh, that we think that the government can put a little bit more energy in. All right. Thank you. Mr. DeFavis, tell me about your uh, uh, business. I'm, uh, all, all of you, uh, all of the witnesses today, today know much more about their businesses than I do, but I know probably the least about your business. And, and what I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering, wondering several things, but tell me, tell me a little bit about uh, your business, is it, uh, uh, is, did, did you see a, a big downturn two or three years ago and is it coming back now and, and uh, what do you see in the uh, future for the uh, warehouse logistics uh, business? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, in, in general, I think the, the warehouse logistics industry in the recent recession did see a downturn. Uh, our particular business, my company is actually in the 80 uh, percent of our revenue is from e-commerce, direct-to-consumer business, and, and we held up pretty well during that period of time and, and continue to see growth based upon the growth of e-commerce. I think the, re, more recently the general industry of warehouse-based logistics continues to see uh, good growth um, because of the increasing reliance 
uh, of manufacturers and others to outsource their logistics needs and to look for more, to concentrate their, all of their time and effort and capital on the things that are their core competencies and, and let someone like a warehouse based 3PL um, begin to do the handle the logistics side of it as, as efficiently as possible. And that's why I think you see in more activities being done within the warehouse that were traditionally done at the manufacturers, whether those be sub-assembly work, refurbishments, uh, repackaging kinds of activities, is that the, the manufacturers are, are starting to stick to the knitting, so to speak, and, and let those that are more uh, appropriately placed Begin to handle those act, be, begin to handle those activities. Also, they can save on the transportation costs. The amount that you have have your products in a warehouse, don't move them from there to somewhere else to be repackaged or redone. Then move back to a warehouse to be delivered to an end customer. Leave them at that point and do as much of these value-added services as you possibly can before you move them out to the end, end user. But I think the industry continues to be uh, to be very bright. If you look at the amount of uh, Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies that outsource to uh, 3PLs, uh, that's going to continue to grow over time. Well, thank you. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Fisher, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that, that you discussed the uh, negative impact of uh, regulations on time-sensitive freight movements. And, and um, in another uh, committee on which I serve a few days ago, there was a <coughs> we had a woman who, who uh, an expert who uh, described herself as a as a progressive or liberal Democrat who generally is in favor of uh, of more regulations. But she said, uh, and I've got the quote here: "At the time each rule was created, it made sense. But over time, the accretion of rules and regulations ends up costing us money and frustrating the public and destroying jobs." And what I'm wondering about. Uh, uh, do you, uh, uh, are there any specific uh, regulations that you see as, as uh, especially um, burdensome? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my testimony did indicate that we as an organization, as the Air Forwarders Association, along with other associations represented here today, are very concerned with FMCSA's new regulations under the CSA program. Um, as you know, hours of service are going into effect on Monday. Uh, but the CSA, CSA is one of many acronyms that we deal with every day, stands for Compliance, Safety, and Accountability. And within the CSA, there is a measurement system that's being promulgated called SMS, which stands for Safety Measurement System. We are concerned that recent, recent statements by FMCSA say that that's not the case, that it's actually a prioritization system and doesn't have as much to do with safety. The point is, all of us in industry and our customers need to have a clear idea of what government wants us to do. And there's much confusion about the promulgation of this regulation. In fact, there are a couple of lawsuits pending against FMCSA on this very subject. So that's just a microscopic version of one of the regulations that could add cost, um, add litigation, and slow down the delivery of goods to our customers. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to bring this hearing to a conclusion here in just a minute, but uh, let me just ask you, the one, one, of the, one of the big things we're discussing here now or about to discuss is the um, uh, Marketplace Fairness Act, the Internet Sales Tax. And every article you read, everybody says that uh, we're going to go more and more with each passing year to doing business over the uh, Internet. Well, uh, uh, um, each of you or some of you tell us what uh, effect you think that may, will make on your businesses and, uh, and what, uh, what it means for uh, our freight mobility and for our transportation system. Mr. Abney. Well, we certainly see the, the e-tailers growing their business uh, quicker than, the, uh, than the most of the brick and mortar companies. What we are seeing, though, is more and more of our customers that do have that brick and mortar are moving to this omni-channel distribution 
to where they're looking at how they can utilize their uh, uh, brick and mortar and, and be able to compete with some of these large e-tailers. A good example of that is uh, uh, a retailer with 100 different stores. If they do uh, have a customer that wants a product that's not in their store, obviously the second choice would be to ship it from distribution into that store and then ask the customer to come back and, uh, and pick it up. Now what we see them do is, is they have total visibility to their systems and they look at which is the nearest store that has that product. And instead of asking the customer to go to that store or shipping store to store, they will ship it from that other store and, and in the next day be able to deliver it to the customer's uh, house or their residence. That is a way that they are able to compete more with the, uh, the large e-tailers. And we're seeing a lot of interest in that area, and we're tailoring uh, products and services around that retail part of our business where people can use this omni-channel distribution. All right. Mr. Rosser, uh, you know, uh, I'm a big baseball fan, but I've said for a long time that I don't believe the national pastime is baseball. The national pastime is going to Walmart on Friday or Saturday night. And uh, <laughs> I've, I, I've found out that that's a... Uh, uh, that's a really good place to campaign. You may not realize it. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't set up a, a headquarters there, but uh, if I have some free time, I can always go in to buy some toothpaste or shaving cream and see a lot of people. Let, uh, uh, tell, tell me, tell me uh, how is Wal what's, what effect uh, uh, Walmart is going to have if... if um, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your business. Um, <laughs> uh, and I uh, hope, hope you had a great experience at the store, too. Um, I would tell you it's in, in conjunction with uh, what Mr. Abney said, it is a rapidly growing uh, segment of business just in general, the e-commerce network. And in my testimony, I stated that we have uh, over 100 distribution centers. Where what we're finding is exactly what Mr. Abney said. We have over 4,000 distribution centers when you think about uh, the role of e-commerce in our network to help support our customer needs. Uh, in the e-commerce in the e channel, uh, generally what you'll find is that customers expect immediacy uh, in terms of response and, and uh, from the time they order their product to the time that they uh, want it delivered. Uh, but what we're also finding is that uh, that customers want a degree of flexibility. There's some items that they do need quickly, and there's some items that they can they can actually wait uh, to to get uh, maybe a little bit longer than today. Uh, but what we're trying to do is come up with solutions in a menu that allows us to to meet whatever the customer's needs is. Uh, and I would just tell you that uh, the solutions are out there in terms of. Uh, delivering uh, from our distribute from our supplier through our distribution centers to our stores, what we call site to store. Uh, we have options uh, out there for our customers uh, to so that we can uh, actually order fill from our stores and send product directly to the customers' homes. Uh, so there's a variety of different solutions that we're actually uh, testing right now across our entire network. So we're learning each and every day how to, how to uh, meet that customer's needs. And I would tell you that uh, we're working with uh, all, of our, all of our suppliers, our transportation partners, to understand how we accomplish that mission to, uh, to solve that equation for the customer. But it is a, a rapidly growing opportunity for, uh, for, for the American consumer. All right. Anybody else? Yes, I would sir. say that uh, we're seeing the the e-commerce segment is probably one of the the fastest and and uh, most entrepreneurial segments of the economy right now. E-commerce entrepreneurs are coming up every day, and uh, we see them all the time. That's who basically our customers are. Um, and I think uh, points have been made about the, you know what's driving e-commerce. It is it's it's convenience for the customer. It's uh, some some of it is price. It's uh, better. It's selection and being able to shop over multiple selections, 
conveniently at home on multiple devices um, is what's driving that. I, you know, if you want to, uh, my personal opinion in terms of, of any impact that a that an e-commerce e sales tax may have, uh, I don't know that that's a, a big driver of e-commerce sales one way or the other. Um, I think there there are other factors that are driving the e-commerce economy. You think that's being somewhat exaggerated, huh? Mr. Fisher, uh, do you have any suggestions on how we how you could make uh, we could make uh, the TSA or the CBP operations uh, a little more efficient or a little less time consuming? Thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. I've been afraid you would ask me that. <laughs> um, I I can tell you that both of those agencies um, believe in stakeholder involvement, and as an association. The Air Forwarders Association has been the go-to association for both TSA and CBP, more recently CBP under different programs. But we have found the private-public partnership with TSA to work very, very well. Um, CBP historically has been known for their sharing of stakeholder information and using stakeholder information to develop programs. Uh, we're working currently with other organizations on the ACAS program, which is an advanced cargo air screening program, which is combined authority with TSA and CBP. And that program is coming along quite nicely. Uh, I don't have any really other suggestions as far as those two agencies are concerned. All right, Mr. Lipinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know that uh, we have some witnesses who have some time constraints here, so just be. Uh, be pretty pretty quick here. Uh, projects of national regional significance, which I had mentioned before. Uh, do you? Uh, I just want to ask all of you: Do you believe that it's important that we uh, do what we did in Safety Lou, have such a program, and pay for it out of the Highway Trust Fund? Map 21 had a program for 2013, subject to appropriations or no appropriations. It's not authorized for 2014. Uh, but this is a way, there are some major projects in the country such as, uh, such as CREATE, but that's not the only one that can only be really get, we can only really get uh, completed, I believe, with large uh, sums of, of money not going to go through formula funds for the states. They're not going not to get it done that way. So uh, does anyone have any, any thoughts on, on that, the, the need for such a program? Mr. Lipinski, I think you have it uh, spot on. Yes, there is a need for such a program. I don't think you can expect a county in Southern California to uh, be able to deal with uh, all of the uh, commerce coming through uh, L.A. Long Beach. Uh, you can't expect uh, Cook County to deal with all the commerce coming through uh, Chicago. So there need to be projects of uh, regional and national significance. Uh, whether or not they are in or out of the trust fund I think is a, an item that can be uh, discussed. But the concept of recognizing that there are such projects uh, I think was a, an important uh, step forward uh, when Congress did, uh, did, did take that step. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? And, and I certainly think it needs to be in the trust fund or else we were subject to the whims of the appropriators who aren't likely just like we saw in, this, in 2013 to, uh, you know, it was zero funded there. Uh, just very, very quickly, what I had raised earlier, Mr. Fisher and Mr. Abney, the effect of um, if there are nighttime closures of uh, towers, uh, the, I, I don't see how we right now avoid doing anything but a, a CR for, for next year. So on October 1st, we'll once again be faced with uh, you know, the FAA is going to have to make cuts. Tower closures may again be out there. Um, so how would those uh, nighttime tower closures impact you, Mr. Fisher? Well, they would likely uh, affect uh, UPS more than they would the Forwarders Association, but there would be uh, delays for us as well. Any tower closure, uh, regardless of the time of day, is going to affect the transportation of air cargo. But particularly nighttime closures would affect the integrators more than forwarders who are putting their shipments on passenger aircraft, although there would be obviously some effect on those passenger flights. But our, our shipments are time critical. We cannot afford any delays, and tower closures anywhere would cause us a problem. Mr. Abney, do you have anything to add to that? 
I do. For UPS, uh, our biggest area of concern by far was Ontario. That is our Western uh, United States Air Hub. We have 27 operations that come in or out of Ontario between 9.30 at night and 7 in the morning. And so from the West Coast standpoint, it's the most important location we have. It was on the original list as a midnight uh, closure. The FAA adjusted that list. They took Ontario off to our uh, pleasure. But it is something that's an ongoing concern that will it come back and, and be on the list. And that would far outshadow any of the other facilities that were on that list as far as affecting our customers' packages. Again, I want to, want to thank all, all of our witnesses. And uh, we have a unique opportunity with this panel and uh, under the Chairman's leadership to really, when we come out with our recommendations that we are uh, asked to do in October, to have a major impact on the reauthorization of MAP 21. We know that there's a lot that has to be done. And uh, so I thank you for uh, your, uh, your testimony here today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just close with this. I just, uh, you know, for many years, uh, we had so many countries that were just completely underdeveloped. We had many, many other countries that were under the thumb of communism or socialism, and they, we, we really didn't have much competition throughout the world. Now, uh, you know, I've traveled all over the world, and I, I remember a been to Vietnam a couple of times, and boy, they're just going gangbusters. I mean, you want to start a business over there, you just go out and start it. And we seem to be, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to, to uh, really let the uh, free enterprise system work the way it could in this country. But we're going to have to, uh, we've got much more competition now from all over the world than we ever had in years past. So we've got to do more. We've got to do better. We've got to be constantly seeking ways to improve. And we have to do that in all areas, but particularly uh, in this area in, in regard to freight mobility. And so that's what we're trying to do with this uh, panel. And I appreciate uh, your all's testimony, uh, your suggestions. If you think of other things that you think we need to know about or take a look at, uh, uh, you, st you certainly can submit that to our staff. But. Uh, that, that will conclude uh, this hearing. Thank you.